Morley, in trying to understand altered states of consciousness, uh, how can yoga help us? Well, the fundamental meaning of the word yoga comes from the root Sanskrit term yug, which means unite, uniting the mind and the body at a very microscopic level and at a macroscopic level, uniting one individual with other people in society, with other members mm. of the human race and with the world. So okay. it's the ultimate union. And I think that's the ultimate goal of yoga. So how does that become an altered state? What, what, what does the yoga do that uh, puts them in this altered state? Looking at it um, j just from externally, and then as you've studied the brain. I'm a brain scientist, and uh, we define three types of altered states. One is the awake, attentive state, like I'm paying attention to you. Mm -hmm. The second is the resting brain. It can either be the sleeping brain or just you know resting calmly without active thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the third is the meditative state. So what studies have shown using a variety of neuroscience techniques, starting initially with EEG studies, which are basically brain scalp recordings of brain electrical activity, to now more modern functional MRI studies, which are mapping the circuits uh, involved in attention, perception, emotional regulation. They've shown that a meditative state induced by yoga breathing, yoga meditation, increases the coherence of the brain. So the coherence means the brain is better connected, the different parts of the brain are working in a much more coordinated fashion, both front to back and top down. And that dramatic increase in coherence or synchrony is what I believe is the enlightened state that's produced uh, by yoga, that allows us the union of the mind and the body and perhaps uh, a social union as well. Okay, so let's look at each aspect. Let's first uh, discuss how what yoga does. They, right. they have certainly body positions. Everybody's familiar with the different yoga positions. Right. Breathing exercises, meditative states. Right. Uh, explain some of those. So there are many, many forms of yoga. Uh, the forms of yoga are so many that I can't even begin to quantify. There's paddle yoga, there's rock yoga, there's disco yoga, there's probably even an electronic dance yoga. The only thing I haven't seen is neuro yoga. I'm sure it's coming. Um, that said, the common elements of yoga are the physical aspects of yoga, which are the poses we call asanas. Then there is the meditative breathing aspect of yoga. So the biggest effects, I think, in terms of brain circuitry, uh, the long-term effects come from the meditative aspects. The physical aspects do have an incredible effect in terms of increasing blood supply to the brain and changing both the soft and the hard wiring of the brain. We know the soft wiring of the brain are the circuits. The hard wiring of the brain is the physical structures in the brain, the neurons, the size and shape of the neurons, if you will. We previously thought the adult brain could not be changed after early childhood, that it was fixed. But we now know that both the soft wiring and the hard wiring of the brain can be changed by experience. This is a phenomenon that we call as neuroplasticity. And yoga has a very profound ability to induce neuroplastic changes in the brain. Are there any specific aspects of yoga that work better than others on the neuroplasticity and the creation of new neurons, uh, whether it's the physical poses or the breathing or the meditative? Both, and I think it's a synergistic effect. Oh. I think the physical poses have a neuroplastic effect. The meditation has a neuroplastic effect. I suspect that they affect slightly different areas of the brain and slightly different types of circuits. But together, it's like 2 plus 2 equal to 5. Now, there are many other things that do that as well. Right. I mean, if I do vigorous exercises, Exercise. I like table tennis where I'm really running around on the table and Correct. get very vigorous and I'm learning how to do things that I can't quite do. Correct. Um, is there anything deeper than that that yoga, yoga brings? Because many, there are many different ways to increase your neuroplasticity. Absolutely. Um, so exercise is a classic uh, experiment, produces dramatic changes in the brain's ability to rewire itself and increase blood supply. We're just beginning to scratch the surface in terms of what yoga does. I think there are more than 200 different effects that have been attributed to yoga. There's a very recent study that's actually that I found very interesting. Uh, they directly compared the brain benefits of 20 minutes of yoga versus 20 minutes of exercise. Uh, and they found that while both sort of improved certain aspects of your cognitive abilities, Yoga actually had a much more profound effect on attention, perception, and emotional regulation, judgment, uh, than a single bout of exercise, suggesting that 
maybe there's something about yoga's calming effects on stress, your relaxation response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those sort of hit a slightly different set of brain regions than exercise does. You talked about the synchrony in the brain that yoga is uh, important in, in building. Now, synchrony in the brain can be a, can be a characteristic of sleep. Right. It, it, it means when all the, the, there's big cycles that all the neurons are doing things in synchrony. Right. And indeed, epilepsy is exactly that. It's an right. exaggerated synchrony of the brain. So synchrony right. by itself is not necessarily good because that's what epilepsy is. That's right. So there's, there's good synchrony and there's bad synchrony. Obviously, epilepsy is an example of a brain synchronization gone bad. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so there are many types of brain waves. Um, there's what we call as the beta waves, which is sort of the classic state when I'm sort of awake and alert. That's considered sort of the, uh, uh, the baseline uh, state, if you will. Uh, then there's the state of sleep that you described. And then there is a, a sort of a high frequency wave called the gamma waves. And the gamma waves are of particular relevance, it appears, for harnessing uh, the benefits of uh, yoga because long-term meditation practitioners not only have gamma waves while they are practicing, but there also appears to be an increase in gamma waves at baseline in between their periods. So you know, it's almost like they're changing their brain's baseline frequency. Uh, and that, I believe, uh, may have a role you know, in terms of how yoga affects its actions. The, the, the gamma uh, waves, what are those normally associated with in uh, non-yoga? So gamma waves are sort of, there's something that were fairly recently sort of discovered and there's still some controversy about it as our EEG techniques get better and better, we'll have better resolution. Gamma waves are thought to be related to all kinds of things such as moral judgments, creativity, not your everyday, uh, just, you know, I'm just paying attention to a TV show or, or uh, reading a book. Uh, in fact, gamma waves, I think the best way I can describe it is, you know, basketball players sometimes say I'm in the zone. Every shot I hit, is a direct net shot. It's like when these players, you know, with 30 seconds left on the clock, they're releasing the ball and it sinks into the neck. Yeah. That is the, probably the closest analogy. You're, you're in the meditative spiritual zone. Mm. And is this across the entire brain? Is it just the frontal areas? Where, where do you find it? So, so the synchrony is across broad swaths of the brain in specific circuits. And, and again, uh, we're still starting to uh, pinpoint which are the different circuits. And, you know, I, I'm not sure there is one single spiritual circuit and different types of practices might sort of trigger different circuits in mm. the brain. And, and sort of we're, we're, we're not fully, uh, uh, we haven't fully elucidated all of the brain regions that are activated by yoga because it, it depends on the resolution of our technology. But as yoga exemplifies an altered state, this yes. third, this meditative yes. state, uh, it, it seems to be not just a, a curiosity, but something that's more fundamental to understanding the brain. Is that right? Correct. And I think the important distinction is where, you know, uh, the brain is a tool through which yoga exerts its effects. And what we find is that the longer you practice, the more these, medit these altered states become sustained and they become the norm. So uh, in one study, for example, they estimated that you might need seven years of practice to really change your brain sort of permanently, if you will, to that higher altered state. Now, that doesn't mean you won't get benefits from short-term practice. You'll get immediate benefits, but then those benefits might wane un unless you keep practicing. And once you keep practicing, uh, your resting brain becomes that way and it changes. And what are some of those benefits in terms of cognitive abilities or right. uh, uh, warding off uh, cognitive problems? Right. So anyone who practices yoga knows that, you know, you, you, you do yoga because one, it makes you feel better, it improves your stress, uh, improves your sleep, uh, you know, it, you think better and you, you're sort of more relaxed. So, uh, you know, in the 1950s, uh, when the first report sort of came to the West, if you will, that yogis could control their heart rate and their breathing. That was uh, pretty much uh, uh, something that blew scientists away. They didn't believe it. Right. And so that was when we knew that the so-called autonomous nervous system, so we have two sort of nervous systems, the one in the brain called the central nervous system, and the one inside you know, the rest of our body that's called the autonomous nervous system because it was thought to be independent, right. that we couldn't control it. Right. And, and when scientists actually showed that yoga meditation induces a relaxation response that activates one component of this autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic system. 
The parasympathetic system contains a nerve called the vagus nerve. It's called vagus because it's like a vagabond. It travels all over your body. It controls your heart. It controls your muscles, controls your respiration. It even controls your sweat glands. And so what they found was that yoga activates the vagus nerve. It slows down your metabolic rate. It induces a profound relaxation response that it, it boosts your immunity. Uh, it calms you down. It increases levels of certain relaxing neurotransmitters and chemicals in the brain. And the net result is you focus better, your uh, concentration is better, your short-term memory input is better because as you focus better, there's more things getting in, they're getting into all the right places and you're putting the right stamp on it as you're archiving the information. Right. Studies have shown now that you can improve mood, you can improve anxiety, even in patients with clinical depression. And in some of the studies, the effects were almost comparable to the effects seen with prescription antidepressants. Studies have even shown that yoga meditation can help people with schizophrenia, not as a monotherapy, but as an adjunct to existing treatments. So there are many schizophrenics who don't do well on current medication. So I, I don't think we've even scratched the surface in terms of what yoga can do to benefit the brain. There was one study where 800 school kids were uh, 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 compared with yoga in a control group and academic performance improved. Mm. So. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge area where we need a national study.